Today I'm going to show you my entire Nintendo Switch collection and not only are we going to go over each and every game, I'm also going to say whether I think it's worth buying or not. Or another way to put it is do I regret buying it? Now I was lucky enough to actually have a Nintendo Switch for almost six years now. I got my first Switch a couple of months after launch and I never looked back. It's safe to say throughout the six years I've owned my Switch, I've racked up quite a few games played. I have a fair number of games in physical, but I'm going to tell you a little secret. I don't actually store my games in their cases. Every single one of the game boxes I'm going to show you are completely empty. And full disclosure, I'm fairly sure I've lost quite a few of these over the years. So if you're wondering how I actually store my physical Switch games, it's in this. It looks disgusting as it is also almost six years old, but this stores all of my physical games and keeps them nice and safe no matter where i travel and i absolutely love it but before we get into my nintendo switch collection let's do the elephant in the room or rather the plushies in the room as i get so many comments every video asking about them and do you want to know the embarrassing part the ones you see aren't even all of them some of them won't even fit on camera for the most part most of the plushies i have are from the pokemon store there is no physical pokemon store in the uk but you can order online with no custom fees whatsoever and delivery is actually surprisingly fast this guy here is actually a small version of baymax and that's from the disney store and a few of them like mew here and there's an eevee here are actually from build bear in the UK. So if you've ever been wondering where all of these are from and the ones you can't see, they're mostly from the Pokemon store. And as always, if you want to keep up to date with all things new and cozy on the Nintendo Switch, make sure you hit that subscribe button. We're trying our best to hit 100k subs on YouTube, which is wild. So I'd love your support. Okay, we're going to start with the games that I actually have boxes for. First up is Kirby and the Forgotten Land. I love this game. This is one of my all time favorite games on the Nintendo Switch and I am obsessed with it. Now, hot take, I think this was far better than Mario Odyssey and I love this game to pieces. This was a completely different direction for the Kirby games and it's only really since I played Kirby Dreamland Deluxe that I realized how much of a step up this Kirby game was compared to all of the previous ones we've played already. Not to mention the fact that Mouthful Mode was both disturbing and incredible all at once and I was so unbelievably blown away by the different types of puzzles the developers made using Mouthful Mode. It was incredible. My main gripe with Kirby and the Forgotten Land is it was just too short. For £50, I wanted there to be a little bit more gameplay for those of us who don't enjoy being completionists because I'm not that type of girl. But honestly, if you're looking for a new Switch game and you haven't tried it, it is incredible. I love it to pieces. I'm actually not looking at what order we have them, so I get to be just as surprised as you guys. Next, we have Link's Awakening. This is... Okay, this might be a weird thing to say. This is the hardest Zelda game I have ever played. I have never in my life needed a walkthrough as much as I did while playing this. But that's kind of why I loved it. First of all, the animation style of this entire game was gorgeous. If you don't know, this is a remake of a very old school Zelda game and it carried everything that was great about the old school Zelda games inside of it, but packaged in this new look, which I loved. For me though, the thing I loved the most about this was probably the dungeons and the puzzles. And I actually love the fact that although there is combat, it doesn't feel very combat driven. The dungeons themselves and the puzzles were tricky, but also a lot of fun. The game packs in so much character and I actually really enjoyed the story so much. It's obviously not a story like Breath of the Wild is a story, but it's still enjoyable nonetheless. And if you can pick this up, not at full price, I do recommend it. Just bear in mind that if you aren't used to old school Zelda games, things aren't really as intuitive as they've become now. So expect to look up a walkthrough because some of the things I just did not understand. Considering this is in a random order, this is pretty breathtaking. Next, we have Breath of the Wild. Do I even need to say anything about it at this point? To me, this game is cozy. To me, this is also one of the best games on the Switch. Full stop. And this right here is probably the reason this whole YouTube channel exists. 
Like many, this was my very first game on the Switch. And actually, the Nintendo Switch is technically my first ever console that I've personally owned. My brother had a GameCube, me and my brother shared the Wii, my dad owned the Wii U, so this was the first ever thing I owned myself. And this right here was my first step back into the gaming world after a rather long time away from it. And Breath of the Wild story, just the whole world, Everything about it, the exploration, the riding around on the horse, everything just made me fall in love with gaming all over again. And if anything, it made me fall in love with games in a way I've never really experienced before. I think it's because I started my PhD when this came out. So for the first time ever, I had a bit of income to spend on games. And I have a lot of things to be thankful for with this game. And falling in love with gaming is the biggest one. Next, we have a old one. This is the first Octopath Traveler. Now, I must admit, now I've played the second Octopath Traveler, I would probably say to buy that one over this one, at least first. And then if you like that one, to go on to this one. They don't relate in any way other than the gameplay mechanics being exactly the same. But I just feel like the characters' stories and how they intertwine at least a little bit and each chapter is better in the second game than it is in the first one. And Octopath Traveler 2 has so many quality of life features that this one desperately needed. But that doesn't make this a bad game. It is still incredible. It's just not as good as Octopath Traveler 2. Next up is the Borderlands Collection. This one I regret. I regret a lot. Now the Borderland games themselves are incredible. I love the Borderland franchise. That's actually why I went to buy it on the Switch. And admittedly, I haven't played this since close to launch time. So it could be that they've done some patches since then. But honestly, it was the controls that really made me not want to pick this game up again. But in handheld, this literally felt almost impossible to play. I really didn't enjoy it. I much preferred playing it on my PC with all the original games. It might be better now, but I've not picked it up since. Next is another Zelda game with Skyward Sword. I haven't finished this. I'm actually a Chronicle game unfinisher, and it's a real problem that I really need to sort out. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I'll get like three quarters of the way through a game before I'm just like, nope, done. I've had enough. Moving on to the next game. And I think that largely comes from the fact that if I enjoy a game, I never want to finish it which I know full well, some of you will understand what I mean. The more I love a game, the less I want to finish it. So I haven't finished this. There's a few things I really like about this that aren't in other Zeldas. And this came from a tweet I saw that kind of made me realize how much I agree. Link in Skyward Sword, again, he doesn't say anything because he doesn't in any game, is so expressive in cutscenes in a way even Breath of the World doesn't even get close to. In Breath of the Wild, he's kind of very plain faced, which I think is kind of also reflective of the fact that we don't just see the exact same link each time we play a game. Like they are different because they had different upbringings, life circumstances. But this version of Link not only is more expressive, I don't know if you guys agree, but he, he definitely fully has a crush on Zelda in this one. But don't worry, I intend on finishing this game before Tears of the Kingdom comes out. It is not a coincidence that this is the remake Nintendo chose to make before Tears of the Kingdom. I fully believe that this story is going to be related in some sort of manner to Tears of the Kingdom. So if you don't want to pay full price and play this game before Tears of the Kingdom comes out, definitely go and look up some YouTube videos explaining the lore and everything that happens in here because I think it's going to be really important. Either way, decent game. I'm not sure I would pay full price for it just because it doesn't look like Breath of the Wild. It doesn't play like it either. It's definitely a big step down. But if you can get it on sale, definitely worth it. Then we have Rayman Legends. Okay, some games are incredible because you have an incredible time playing them. Other games are incredible because you have incredible memories associated to them. And that's why I love Rayman Legends. Not to mention the fact you can quite often pick it up for like literally six quid. This to me is so special because my dad would come home from work and we'd literally dedicate hours each week to just me and him 
playing this together, having fun. It's basically just a platformer that you can play with up to three other people. But one of the things I love the most about it is that they dedicate a button to being able to slap each other. What more can you ask for from a co-op game? There are so many levels inside of it and my absolute favorite levels are the ones that are done in time to the music. It's such a quirky game. It's so underrated. Like I didn't, I never see anyone talk about this. And there's even really fun mini games you could play with friends as well. The football mode me and my brother used to play all the time because it's just pure chaos. So if you're after a actually quite challenging, very inventive platformer, because not only are there normal platforming levels, there are also levels where you have to undock your switch and play it with the touch screen on, which I think is really cool. It has it all. It's a lot of gameplay for a ridiculously small price whenever it's on sale. Speaking of games that give you incredible memories, we have Nintendo Switch Sports. Is this a game I gravitate to daily? Absolutely not. But this is my go-to whenever my family want to play, whenever I go around a friend's house, for a party, for an evening in, this is the one. I'd argue that there are actually only three games on the Nintendo Switch that you can play with non-gamers. And this is one of them. Take tennis, for example. You don't need to have ever played a game before to be able to pick up a Switch remote and swing it whenever the ball comes near you. It's that simple. And that's why I love it so much. I think the game selection they picked for all the different sports is amazing. I absolutely love what they did with the bowling. I think a bowling battle royale was such a cool move and I wish I would have seen it for some of the other sports. I really like the fact that they took the volleyball game and decided to make that a little bit more complex with the movements and also have some sort of strategy in it. But I also love that they took the classics like tennis and kept it relatively simple so you could play it with young ones, with your older relatives, anyone really, and they're guaranteed to at least hit the ball a few times. My only gripe with this is I feel like for the price, we kind of needed a few more sports. Then we have Fire Emblem Three Houses. Again, I won't spend too long on this. Not only is this one of my favorite RPGs of all time, it is also one of my favorite games of all time. For me, the real reason it's in the top tier place is because of the story. I fell in love with the story from the first cutscene. I love the fact that throughout the game and the game story, you don't just feel like you're watching it. You feel like you're involved in it because later on you make actual decisions that will affect which ending you get in the game. And I think that kept me very present and caring so much about even the smallest things that happened in the story. I also think because you can turn off permadeath in the settings, this is a great first tactical RPG for people. So if you want to do the battles, but you don't want the serious consequences of your own actions, then you can use that mode and have a lot of fun and enjoy the story and not see your favorite characters disappear because of one bad decision you made. Then we have... I didn't even realize I got this as a physical. Okay, I'm going to start off by saying this is an incredible game. Do not get me wrong. This is spectacular they improved on so much compared to splatoon 2 especially the graphics actually when i go back and i look at splatoon 2 it is wild how far this game has come compared to that considering it's on the exact same system now i need to give this another go but if i'm gonna be entirely truthful this lost its spark for me and i don't know if it's because i'm older or if i'm a worse shooter gamer now i don't know what it is but I get incredibly frustrated playing Splatoon 3 in a way I rarely got in Splatoon 2. But I even find Turf War really annoying and really frustrating. It just seems to me that I don't have any close games. When we lose a game, we lose spectacularly. And on the rare occasion I win a game, we win by miles. So I don't know if it's the matchmaking system just doesn't quite work. A part of me thinks that maybe it'll be better now Christmas has been because I think a big issue was not many people had bought the game. Only the hardcore players had bought the game, meaning that the people who were actually good at the game were mostly the ones playing it. So I do need to give it another go. Now I've got a big TV to play it on. I don't know. It's definitely worth it if you like that sort of game. I just need to figure out why I haven't been enjoying it. Next, we have Astral Chain. Let me start off by saying this is fantastic. I just struggled to get into it. I don't think I gave it a fair go. The thing that got me was each of the levels you played in, 
you kind of got a rank and i'd think i did a level well and then i'd get a really really bad rank and i'd feel really demotivated by it the battling and the battle mechanics also absolutely incredible it was such a unique battle system and it ran buttery smooth i think i played about 15 hours with it before i put it down and then just never picked it back up again definitely a game to check out though if you like the look of it it's by no means bad i think it's just one of those games that didn't really resonate with me enough for me to pick it back up and then we have octopath traveler 2 i want to understand why is so few people talking about this i love it to pieces i've just split my time across far too many games at the moment so i haven't made as much progress but i feel like people haven't been talking about this and it makes no sense because i think this is absolutely incredible there is such a range to the eight different stories in them and I care so much for the characters in a way I didn't quite manage in the first Octopath. And one thing I absolutely love is some of the stories are super heavy and they have, you know, incredibly heavy topics. The character is hard done by and you're doing your best to try and get them to see justice and help them out. But there's also some really lighthearted stories as well. Like one story is basically just trying to become a dancer. And I know some people think, oh, they feel a little bit pointless having those types of stories and then stories where, you know, you have to save your whole entire town. But to me, I actually really like that because you can do a really heavy storyline. And then when you're like, oh, I could really do with a break from topics like that, you can go and do a bit of a lighthearted storyline. And to me, I love that balance between all of them. I also adore the art style. I also think you get so much gameplay for your money. If you don't know, each of the eight characters has four different chapters to do and I am 15 hours in and I don't think I've quite done each of the eight characters chapter one stories yet. So I have a long way to go, but super underrated, which is wild because the first game was literally critically acclaimed. And I think this one has raving reviews as well. I'm just sad no one's talking about it. We are down to my last three boxes and then we have loads of other physical games that for some reason I don't have the boxes for. First up is... Look, I'm about to pick this back up, okay? This is an incredibly good workout. It's also not been played for like... a year. <laughs> Maybe longer, a year might be generous. To be fair, you need quite a lot of space. And that's been my main downfall in that I've been living in teeny tiny flats and haven't been able to do half of the game because it requires you to sit on the floor and I haven't had enough floor space, but I don't have any excuse now. If you are looking for a workout at home and a way to stay motivated to work out at home, this is quite good. You can even set up reminders on your Switch to tell you to play the game. And if you have an Apple Watch like I do, there's even a setting to say like you're playing video games as a workout. So you can even track your calories and do stuff like that. It's good, but it is expensive. All right, we have two games left. Both of these are pretty recent. I don't have too much of an opinion on this. This had a lot more gameplay than I was maybe first anticipating though, but I haven't played that much because I gave it to my dad. I was like, oh, dad, you like platformers. Why don't you play this? I'm not, I don't have time to play it tonight. Do you want to have a go with this? And uh, I'll come and collect it to make a video. I haven't had the game back yet. And my dad plays it not only in the evenings, but every single time he has a lunch break, he will get on and play it for at least 10 minutes minimum. So I think it's safe to say if you are an OG platformer, you'll enjoy it. One thing they kind of glossed over, I feel like in the trailers and didn't really mention is that there are a ridiculous amount of mini games that you can play with up to four people. It's absolutely wild. I was shook when I saw how many of them there were. They're all pretty fun as well. They use motion controls. There are a whole range of them. And another thing I liked that kind of was glossed over a little bit, there is an easy mode. So if platformers are not your typical type of thing, or you just suck at them and you want to enjoy the game regardless, at the very start of the game, it kind of asks you if you want easy mode on, aka do you want, I think it's, is it Meta Knight to kind of save you every single time you fall off the map and things like that? Then you can say yes and the game gets substantially easier and a lot more enjoyable for people who suck at platformers. Old school platformers aren't really my jam though. 
But if they are, I think it's worth it. And then we have Fire Emblem Engage. I like this. Not as much as Three Houses, but I still like it. For me, I just kind of wished that there was more kind of interactivity with the story. I also feel like there were just too many characters. I kind of picked my favorites early on and didn't really stray too far from them. One thing I was amazed at is the graphics. This has to be one of the best looking games on the Nintendo Switch. It looks absolutely stunning. I just feel like I kind of felt like I was just hopping from cutscene straight into battle to cutscene to battle again. And to me, it felt too battle heavy. But for the people who didn't really enjoy the in-between stuff of Three Houses, this will definitely be your favorite between the two. The story is good though. I never knew where it was going. I fell in love with a couple of characters. I just, for me, place it just below three houses. Right, we are missing quite a lot of boxes. So unfortunately, we're going to do the ratchet thing and go through the physicals where I haven't quite found the boxes of. First up is YouTuber's Life 2. This is such an underrated live sim. You basically become a YouTuber slash streamer. The thing I love is they obviously didn't have the licensing to call each console and each game their actual names so they come up with different names i think animal crossing for example was like creature crosswalks so it was a bit of fun figuring out what the games you were buying in the game were in real life but the premise is pretty simple you basically get put in a house get told to create content you earn money from creating content that you can then spend on either making your gear better or buying new games or new consoles but there's also an overarching story that involves wormholes literal famous youtubers like pewdiepie is in the game and like saving the world all whilst you stream and make youtube videos it's incredible <laughs> and yes there is a nintendo switch equivalent and literally every one of the big nintendo switch games there's also giant gaming events that you can attend it's kind of the equivalent to vidcon where you can go and film yourself playing the latest and newest games which i think is really cool it's such a slept on game when it comes to cozy gaming and i definitely recommend it the only downside there is is the loading times in and out of buildings is kind of long on the switch but that's my only gripe and I think it was like three months ago or something there was a giant update that brought in a ton of new content completely for free so if you're watching reviews that are older than like three months they're missing out on a ton of new features and a ton of new content so take them with a grain of salt then we have splatoon 2 i've talked about this i have a lot more gameplay time and a lot more good memories with splatoon 2 than splatoon 3 but no don't buy it this game's dead well dying one of the biggest things about the splatoon games is they have constant updates constant new modes and constant events that's currently happening in splatoon 3 and as that player base grows splatoon 2 dwindles and dies so even if you can find splatoon 2 on offer it's really not worth it then we have the 51 worldwide games game is there a second game at the end no there isn't i've just created that you know earlier when i said there are three games on the nintendo switch that non-gamers can play this is one of them. It's just a game with 51 well-known, well-loved board games and mini games. Like there's Pong, there's also bowling, but then you have chess, checkers, like literally every card game you could think of to play with your friends. But the reason why I love them over actual board games is it's introduced me to so many different games and genres that I never would have picked up before. And it has a really comprehensive guide on how to play right at the beginning so you can learn everything you need to know before going into the game in a really nice way then we have super smash bros brawl this is just not my type of game okay as someone who primarily plays on my own this was just not fun every single time i played online it just seemed to lag and wasn't that great also i really sucked at it so i just lost by miles when we played online anyway it's a great party game if you are playing with other people who semi know how to play or know their way around a controller. If you are playing with people who don't really game, there is no chance of them picking it up anytime soon. I just think that it's it's a really great game. It's just not my type of game and I didn't enjoy it that much. Then there's Xenoblade Chronicles 2. This used to be one of my favorite games of all time. And then Xenoblade Chronicles 3 came out and that became one of my favorite games of all time. 
Now, this one is kind of controversial to like. While Xenoblade Chronicles 3 took a more realistic character approach, this one really didn't and kind of leaned further into like the anime type cutscenes. And kind of once you got over like the sort of cringiness that was the beginning of the game, you kind of learn to love it and that's what makes me love this so much. After like the third hour, I could not wait for each cutscene. I was ready for whatever was going to happen in each of them. Just don't play this in a public place. Some of the cutscenes were maybe, maybe a little bit questionable, but I loved it nonetheless. Next, we have Mario Golf. Now, before Switch Sports came out, I probably would have recommended this more. I now think this is borderline pointless with Switch Sports. I don't think these games should have been released on their own. There was another one, Mario Tennis Aces. I didn't own that, but if those had come out together, it would have been a lot more worthwhile. Having this full price is slightly questionable. I can't remember if this even had like a campaign mode. I don't think it did, but Mario Tennis Aces does. Either way, I don't really know why you'd buy this over Switch Sports. It was fun. The battle mode was fun, but not worth the price they were trying to charge. Then we have WarioWare. This to me is one of the most disappointing games that has ever come out on the Switch. And it's for one big reason. I vividly remember on the Wii having so much fun with the WarioWare game. The ways it used the Wii controller to make you do mini games were genius, were so much fun, and I thought it was incredible. And genuinely, the Nintendo Switch has really been lacking on games that use the motion controls in any fun way. But WarioWare decided to say, screw what worked on the Wii, we're going to go this new route that involves no motion controls whatsoever and is fully on the controller. Now, I do think having control options is a must for accessibility, but I wish they also use motion controls as well and kind of let you choose which way you wanted to play the game. Just for me, I really miss the wacky motion controls. Next is Mario Kart 8. Since the DLC has come out, I was borderline on whether I thought the DLC was worth it. Now, after, is it Wave 3 or 4 has come out? 4. I think we just had Wave 4. After Wave 4, I am genuinely really happy with the DLC so far. I do think it's worth the money. Mario Kart's just kind of a classic. No one does driving games the way Nintendo does. It's my favorite and only driving game. And I play it when I'm stressed and I have a great time. It looks great. It runs great. And I definitely recommend it for someone who's looking for just a little bit of fun, especially when you're with friends. Then we have Pokemon Shield. I have a lot of love for Pokemon Shield. It is literally the reason why I got into shiny hunting. And I think that game got me back into Pokemon in general. Before that, I don't think I had touched a game since Omega Ruby. So I'm very thankful that I got into it. My only gripe, I say only, my massive gripe with it is the story was awful. I mean, the story itself was good, like the plot and everything. My issue was with how our character interacted with the story. Every single time something cool was about to happen, you were literally told, don't worry about it. You continue with the gyms. Us adults are going to deal with it. And then you do the gym and they tell you how they dealt with it. So all of the action you completely missed because I get it. You're a child, but you're also one of the most strongest battlers in the whole area. Yeah, I just wish we got involved with the story a little bit more. And of course, the cutscenes will always feel lackluster when they're not animated properly and they have no voice acting. And that's always going to make the story feel worse. I genuinely do not understand how a genre that has its own anime and its own ability to make films and that sort of thing can't use any of those assets or any of those people to make proper cutscenes. If the Pokemon franchise could just like overlap a little bit more i think all around their content would be better also some of the pokemon movies have insanely good plots why don't some of those writers help write a game with a fantastic plot that would be incredible wouldn't it i cannot believe i don't have the box for this it's somewhere but we have animal crossing this is probably the second game responsible for this channel existing i have over 3000 hours in animal crossing and shockingly, I've never once finished an island. Animal Crossing New Horizons will have a special place in my heart always, 
because it is the reason I made it through the pandemic and came out the other side semi okay. That game provided a routine when I had none. That game had me playing for hours with my friends on voice chat as we came over for wishing stars or to sell turnips each and every day. And it helped many when they needed it most. Like I couldn't go see people in person, but I could go speak to my villagers each and every day to check up on them and have them check up on me and ask me how I'm doing, which really meant a lot. Do I have problems with the game? Absolutely. I wish it was more of a life sim and less of a decorating game, but that's just a personal opinion. And I think the game is fantastic. If you're looking for a cozy game, and you haven't played it yet, please do. It's incredible. That's it for my physical library. So now we're getting into digital games. Also, this is going to give you a little bit of an idea as to what games I've played and when. We're going to start off with Persona 5 Royale. You might be surprised to see this is my most recently played game, but that is because the game is so freaking long. It does not end ever but the story is absolutely fantastic i love the live sim elements of going to school deciding when your character studies when they train when they make friends with other people it even tells you when exams are coming up and gets you to answer questions in school and uh, i discovered how bad i'd be if i had to go to school again but also the battling side of the story is also so interesting it has really unique turn-based mechanics and also has kind of two stories happening at the same time. The beginning of the game kind of sees you in a jail cell getting interrogated and every single time they ask you a question, you kind of reminisce and then you play the game from your schoolboy perspective. The whole thing together, incredible. One of my favorite games, full stop and I'm enjoying it a lot. Then we have Pokemon Scarlet, the best worst game to have ever existed. Did I have a lot of fun playing it? Yes. Did it run terribly? Also, yes. Would I recommend it? I don't know. It's a hard thing to recommend. Like, yeah, go spend 50 quid on this game. Will there be huge frame drops? Yeah. Will the graphics be so bad at points you question what you are playing? Also, yes. But despite all of that, you also get to run around an open world catching Pokemon that spawn in the wild with no random encounters whatsoever. And it truly, for the first time, feels like Pokemon is a real universe that truly exists in some sort of real capacity. Also, the story is a huge step up. I mean, still no voice acting or no real cutscenes, but the end of the main story, like the last like hour and a half, was incredible. I didn't see half of it coming. The Area Zero stuff was a lot of fun. And other than the gym storyline, the Titan storyline literally had me crying at one point. And actually the team star bases, that overall story arc was really satisfying. So I think the story came a long way. I just wish the graphics and the game looked better. It's gonna be interesting to see if they fix any of that come the DLC. Who knows? Then we have Story of Seasons Do Raymond, another game I wish I had played more. I did really enjoy it when I was playing it. It's basically a standard Story of Seasons game where you play as the characters from Do Raymond instead. The art style they picked was a lot of fun. I did really enjoy the story that it was using and doing throughout the farming sim, which is something I think the game franchise lacked a little bit with the likes of Pioneers of Olive Town was a good background story that kept me playing. It just came out at a time where I had a lot of other games, so I just didn't play it that much. Then we have Hoko Life. I've been trying my best to get back into Hoko Life. I gave it a really hard time because I really got creeped out by some of the villagers in the game. But I was trying to give it a new go because it's had a lot of updates. I've seen so many aesthetic things and builds on my Twitter page, which made me want to get back into it. If you don't know one unique or cool thing about Hoko Life is you build and kind of design and decorate your own furniture. And from Twitter, it looks like you can share codes and get other people's furniture in your game. But the game progresses so slow so slow and the other issue is that it has huge loading times between areas so if you want to go to the shops there's a huge loading time to get into the area with the shops and then another loading time to get from the shops into the building which was so frustrating then we have triangle strategy i'm not gonna say a lot because i'm literally less than an hour into it i'm struggling but i haven't given it a good chance 
So we'll circle back to triangle strategy when I've given it more of a go. Then we have Doff Romantic. Ugh, it is such a good and soothing puzzle game. It's so satisfying. I don't feel annoyed whatsoever when I play it. I love the fact that you unlock more tiles as you go, which makes each and every time you build your landscape feel unique. If you're completely new to the game, then basically you get these hexagonal tiles where you have different kind of environments that you need to try and match up with each of the edges. So some of your edges might have forests, you might have a river, you might have a plain field or even a little village. And as you connect them, you make your villages larger, you make your forests larger, and you build this beautiful landscape tile by tile. Now you can either play it just for fun and just to enjoy the experience, or you can also get scored on it as well if you kind of want to play it competitively. And you can give yourself more tiles if you make some of the tiles perfectly line up. Overall, one of my favorite little puzzle games, and it's a lot of fun. Then we have Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. It's the only Xenoblade Chronicles I haven't finished. In fact, I'm only like six hours into it. I really struggle to get into it, but I'm going to try. That's kind of my goal for 2023 is to finish a lot of my unfinished games on my list, which is a lot of them, and also buy more physical games. I rarely make the effort to go and get them physically, and it's just, it's more satisfying having the boxes, even if I do lose them. Then we have Blanc. Blanc would be a fantastic game if you had someone to play with. Having someone to play with makes it this beautiful, chill experience where you kind of traverse the landscape as a fawn and a cub, helping each other out so you can find your parents again. And you basically just follow the tracks in the snow. And the cool thing is each of the two characters kind of has their own skill. And together you use them to get the both of them through. Playing this on your own, it takes it from a really chill adventure to an incredibly intense brain exercise. Because the way they did it on a controller is each of the sticks and the sides control one of the characters. So your left stick will, for example, control the fawn. And the right stick will make the wolf cub run around. So controlling them both at the same time required a level of brain power I haven't used since I did my PhD. And I was kind of fine when the side of the screens lined up with which Joy-Con I was using. But as soon as they crossed, my brain just like pfft, jelly, absolute jelly. It's beautiful, it's stunning, it's fantastic, but... Boy, was it hard. I'm not going to talk about Cuddly Forest Friends, mainly because I have another video coming out about all the cozy games that I've played in 2023 so far. Is it fun? Yes. Is it cute? Also, yes. Did it cost 25 quid? Yes. And that's, that's the part I'm struggling with at the moment, is figuring out if that is worth 25 pounds. Then we have Disney Dreamlight Valley. We're, we're just not, we're not going to go there. I have like 200 hours on it. I stream it most of the time on Twitch. It's kind of replaced Animal Crossing for me and become a part of my daily routine. Do I have issues with it, especially with the way it runs on the Switch? Absolutely. And also with the premium shop, but it's still fun. I still like it. It still has so much potential. Then we have No Man's Sky. Need I say more? One of the best cozy games out there. Yeah, it's, it's a cozy game. If you change the settings to make it a cozy game, I love exploring. I love the fact that they're still doing constant updates to the game. I love the way it looks, it's especially if you play it off of the Switch. Don't get me wrong, the Switch version runs flawlessly. But when you have either a beastie PC or like an Xbox X or something, then it looks incredible. It's literally like the pinnacle game for space exploration. And I never thought it'd be so much fun to land on a random planet and see what wacky creatures are walking around so you can catalogue them. Some of these we're going to skip over, mainly because they're coming in a video like next week or the week after. We have Sky Children of the Light, though. I was incredibly thankful when they sponsored me because it's been a game I have adored for so long. If you're looking for the best free game on the Switch, then look no further than it. It is cozy. It is fun. Although the last levels are terrifying it just runs flawlessly and i can't believe it's free every time i log on to it dragon quest treasures one of my go-to games when i'm sitting and watching tv there isn't that intense a story and you just literally run around looking for treasure following a little compass map there is combat but i just kind of let my monsters deal with it and i don't really take part in it whatsoever 
I've seen a lot of people tell me it's not chill, not cozy, or not even good, and I completely disagree. For me, games can be good for different reasons, and this is one of the perfect games for me to play while watching something on TV. It's just the perfect level of passiveness. Like, you need to actively play it, but you're not, like, sitting through cutscenes that you need to pay attention to. Oh, then we have Akka. I know this was super buggy the first day it came out, but i just it was just so good it's a short game but not only is it fun to play and is beautiful the storylines are surprisingly hard hitting in like a kind of wholesome but also gut-wrenching way the controls are a little fiddly which i think is where it caught a lot of people off guard but if you treat it less like a farming sim and more like a... It's, it's kind of like a life sim, but also not at the same time because you're kind of working on making the land better and speaking to people and helping them through the fact that the land just saw a giant war. It's just a really, really unique and really special game. And I definitely recommend looking it up if you haven't seen it yet. Beacon Pines and Ooblets. All I'm going to say is two of my favorite indie games, two of my favorite Switch games, both of them are incredible in their own way, but I've talked about them non-stop. Love them. Pokemon Legends Arceus. If you are looking to get into Pokemon, I'd say start there. The story's good, a little bit dry, but the catching mechanics are so much fun. There's barely any battling. Like, the battling isn't a huge part of the game. And shiny hunting is still, for me, way more fun than it is in pokemon legends arceus and the catching mechanics are just so much more fun than pokemon scarlet and violet i just for me that game had everything i was looking for and i really hope they do another legends game a little to the left so short like unbelievably short i wish it was longer but the puzzles are so satisfying and so much fun. I love the fact that puzzles have multiple solutions. I think that's a really cool addition. Then we have Harvestella. I spoke about this in my RPGs video, so I won't spend too long on it. It's a farming sim. It's an RPG and it is criminally underrated on the Switch. The story is incredible. I just wish they had cutscenes and voice acting. The farming mechanics actually feel like they have a purpose because not only do you make money from them, you cook using them, giving you food that will replenish your HP in like boss battles and in the little dungeons you go to. And I kind of love the fact that it's an RPG that kind of considers what you do outside of the saving the world part. Like, for example, you need to travel each and every day to the part where the story takes part in. And then each night you need to return to your own bed, to your own home, to rest up, gather supplies for the next day and then set out on your journey again. And for me, that just kind of makes the world feel a lot more realistic. Is it perfect? No, but it's incredible. I really like it. Lonesome Village. I really like that game. The puzzles were so much fun in it. The live sim elements were a lot of fun, but sometimes felt a little bit pointless. But if you're looking for a really wholesome puzzle game and a lot of gameplay for your money, actually, I would recommend it. I, I had a lot of fun playing it. I'm not going to spend too long on Wildflowers. I wasn't able to give it a good shot when it first came out because around the time it came out was also the time my grandfather got hospitalized and the storylines just weren't really... I wasn't really in a good place to play it. But I have recently started picking it up again and it is incredible. It's a farming sim where you're also a witch and the whole game is voice acted as well. It runs flawlessly on the Switch. Like, it creeped me out the fact that there was basically no loading times whatsoever and they're constantly offering free updates on the game with more content as if you needed any more reason to buy it both lemon cake and bunny park are by the same developer they're both really cute and adorable in their own way they're both quite short though and are definitely not worth full price so i'd recommend them if you could buy them on sale Neither of them really have much replay value once you finish them either. So for the same price, I think you can do better. Then we have Xenoblade Chronicles 3. I have talked about it endlessly. One of my favorite games of all time. It's the story that got me the most emotional that I have ever been in my entire life. It's one of the only games I have finished in the last like four months as well, which is really bad. But I loved the storyline so much. I think it was the best out of all the three Xenoblade Chronicles for me personally, I think the story was beautifully written, beautifully handled, 
I think it looks fantastic on the Switch. Just, it deserved to be in the Gamer of the Year nominations, no matter what other people think. I loved it. We also have Potions Permit, another game I have talked about a lot because I love it. If you're looking for a cozy game that has no farming, still beautiful stories, friendship mechanics, and still a lot of fun and a good like life sim apart from the farming side, then I think Potion Permit is the game for you. There is some combat, there is some foraging for items and resources that happen on the daily, but if you can handle that and you enjoy the little puzzles that are making potions, I think you'll really enjoy the game. We also have Lost in Play. This is my favorite point and click adventure game that I've played on the Switch. Some of the puzzles were a little bit hard and I can't remember if there was a hint system in the game at all, but the story is really wholesome despite the fact that there are no words said whatsoever in the game. The story is still depicted beautifully and it takes place in the kids kind of imaginations and one of my favorite parts is you'll finish a puzzle and it will take a moment where their kind of imagination kind of fades and you see where they are in real life maybe something you were sat in turns into a cardboard box and you can kind of see where these ideas came from from everyday items which i really liked it's definitely the old school point and click mechanics kind of thing so if you're like me, you will get stuck a few times because you can't quite figure out how to use or combine an item. But I found it really satisfying and enjoyed it a lot. We also have Stardew Valley, a classic. Have I finished the game or the community center ever? Nope, I have not. But I love it. That's my goal for this year. I want to finish Stardew Valley this year, okay? Uh, by finish it, I just mean finish the community center. Because as a cozy gamer... I am appalled that this is not a game I have finished. We also have Cat Cafe Manager. It's another game that like, if you read a review of it, you probably wouldn't pick it up. But if you're looking for a game to kind of chill out and play while you're like watching TV, watching a film, that's what I really like it for. Like in the evenings, I'll have like YouTube videos up and I'll play something like Cat Cafe. And that is my perfect evening in. Mario Strikers, don't buy it. Well, no, don't buy it. It's not worth full price. I haven't picked it up since launch day. I regret buying it so, so much. I am not impressed by it. I think it's one of the worst games Nintendo have put out. And it's kind of shocking that they charge full price for a game that doesn't even have a literal story mode. So you have to play online to enjoy it or against NPCs, which is, you know, not great half the time. Fire Emblem Warriors and also Hyrule Warriors while we're talking about it. Both of them, I wasn't a fan of the Warriors kind of battle style. If you are a fan, they're both decent games. Hyrule Warriors, I did enjoy the cutscenes. We got way more cutscenes than we did for Breath of the Wild. Uh, I think I would have had just as good a time on YouTube looking up the cutscenes because the Warriors gameplay just, it got too repetitive for me. Even though it was good and it was fun for what it was. Just not my style. Pokemon Diamond and Pearl is so hard. Having played Scarlet and Violet, I will say Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, the Elite Four, were way harder than they were in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. I think that's a good thing, mostly. I also was taken by surprise at how good the story was. I had actually not played Diamond and Pearl before the remakes, and I really liked the art style. But it was a game I, once I did the Elite Four, I kind of didn't, I didn't shiny hunt or anything like that on it whatsoever. I just kind of played it for the storyline and that was about it. And then finally, we have the Mario Parties. There is a whole lot of other like small indie games, games that I bought on sale. But if I haven't played enough of them, I haven't really spoken about them today. They do exist in my library though. But there are two Mario Parties. A good Mario Party and a bad Mario Party. Mario Party Superstars is the good Mario Party. If you are going to buy a Mario Party, buy that one. The mini games are so much better. The courses are a lot more fun than they are in the other Mario Party game. And the online is just from day one was a better experience. And Mario Party is the third game on my list that is perfect for non-gamers. Because the cool part is, if you turn the bonus stars on at the end, it doesn't matter how many mini games you've won. You could lose every minigame and still end up with a couple of bonus stars just because that's how they work. My mum isn't a big gamer and she can figure out basically all of the minigames eventually. So I think if she can do it, anyone can do it. I know we glossed through a lot of them at the end and I know you can see games I haven't really talked about, but I've kind of 
picked the ones I thought were worth mentioning while showing my entire library. If there's any games you'd want to hear more information on though, let me know in the comments down below. And I'd love to know what your top five games are full stop. And if you want to see every game I'm looking forward to in spring, click this video here. I'll see you next time. Bye.